My name is Thomas Keegan with LibertarianProgressive.com. We are an independent media organization. We interview independent and third-party candidates who are on the ballot and the only third-party option on the ballot in their area. There's a lot more going on this election season on November 8, 2016, than just the presidential race. We believe Congress, a co-equal branch of government, deserves a co-equal amount of consideration in the media. Most polls have a consensus to elect all of Congress out. We want to make that decision easier for voters via presenting candidates who are the only third options in their districts. And today we're talking with Rick Breckenridge, and you can find out more information right now at facebook.com forward slash breckenridge.congress. That's B-R-E-C-K-E-N-R-I-D-G-E dot congress. And Rick is running as um, for, actually, the U.S. House of Representatives in the great state of Montana. Montana has one representative that is sent to Congress, so it's Montana at large. Rick, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. We actually um, know that you have a debate you're going to be in in about three hours from now, so we wish you good luck in that. And we also know that um, you're a replacement uh, candidate this year at you know, maybe a few weeks ago, Mike Fellows was the original libertarian. He had a car accident that he did not recover from, and that's very tragic. And we definitely send our prayers and, um, you know, best hopes and wishes to his family and uh, any of his fans. We actually did interview him at the earlier in the season. So, well, please tell us about yourself and what you're going to bring to this campaign and uh, what you're hoping to convey to your electric in the remaining 30 plus days until November 8th, sir. Well, Thomas, thank you for the time and uh, for this opportunity. Um, as you said, I, I am a replacement on the ballot. Mike Fellows uh, did pass away in a, in a car accident. And um, so uh, it kind of left the Libertarian Party in just a little bit of disarray, but there was an organized um, central committee in, in uh, Ravalli County, which is uh, Hamilton, south of Missoula. And so, um, you know, picking up those pieces in there and um, really taking the message forward. I'm, I'm picking up a banner that uh, has been dropped, and Mike's been the standard bearer for 30-odd years, and I have no, um, you know, no words to express uh, gratitude for, for what he's done those 30 years in Montana for, for liberty and freedom. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a professional land surveyor. Uh, I have been a land surveyor uh, in Montana since uh, 1994. I've gone all over the West, uh, Oregon, Washington, um, Montana, uh, Arizona as a, as a land surveyor for the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and uh, went into private practice in 2003 uh, full-time after putting in the Montana Cadastral Mapping Project. It was a huge undertaking. It took me nine years to map Flathead County. And uh, so that's my background. I'm a surveyor along the lines of, you know, Thomas Jefferson and, and uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. We're all surveyors. My great-grandfather's mm-hmm. surveyor, my grandfather, my dad, my uncle, me, both my sons are registered land surveyors in Montana and Hawaii. So um, that's kind of the background. I come from a very property rights-oriented um, position. And uh, with private property rights uh, comes personal liberty, and you can't have one without the other, life, liberty, and property. That's what we got to have. And so um, what I'm trying to bring into this this debate is that, um, you know, it's been insanity what we've been doing for the last 150 years electing you know, the same process over and over again. We always expect different results, and uh, at the debate in Great Falls we had on Wednesday, um, you know, we, we brought that to the forefront that um, what we have done to um, the American Indians, is, you know, we got eight tribes here in Montana, what we've done experimenting on them with not only socialized medicine and, and education has, uh, has uh, done damage that uh, we need to rectify and make right. Um, you know, the, the, the dependence of you know montana has 29 percent of its land it's the fourth largest state in the union and 29 percent of that land is is uh, owned by the federal government 
and uh, both both uh, Ryan Zinke, the incumbent congressman, and Denise Juno, the um, the Democrat nominee, have said we are absolutely not going to sell any public land. Well, I happened to map uh, for the cadastral mapping project, you know, the town sites in uh, in Georgetown and in, in Deer Lodge County and Phillipsburg over in Granite County. And with all, you know, there's one section had over 340 mineral claims in, or in four sections. So there's little strips and little silver slivers of federal land in there that number one are impossible to manage and let and have no intrinsic value, except if they could be, you know, put or added to another person's property. And um, so what I'm advocating is that you guys say never, both of you, Denise and uh, Juno and Ryan Zinke, you you build walls because you don't understand the 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 the, the, the process and, and what has happened in our public lands and how how it all evolved and what it was supposed to supposed to do. So I'm bringing that discussion as a as an expert as a professional land surveyor. I'm bringing that discussion to the forefront that you guys neither one of you are qualified to make those decisions and we're suffering under the um, you know in the western states we're suffering under the mismanagement of public lands by people just like them you know uh, you come out to montana in august and you can't hardly breathe because of all the forest fires and the same in idaho and washington and oregon and california so that's one of the issues that uh, i'm hoping that we can shed some light on tonight at the debate in uh, in bozeman sure absolutely and by the way i think mike uh looking down would be proud to have you as a replacement and to carry the mantle and the, you know you're giving people that option you know so that they have more than just the two options so we do thank you again for your time here rick well, and it's kind of interesting that you say that because um mike has been sick uh, with uh, renal failure for about the last six months and and he went into the hospital and uh, a group of uh came up and asked him and said mike uh you know you're not going to be able to make it and uh, so they started asking around the state and you know, on the bench to for names if they'd be willing to take his name on the ballot and uh, when they contacted me i said you, you bet I, without hesitation and mike picked me picked my name out of the group and said but the only way rick can get on the ballot is if uh, something happens to me and i die and uh, that was uh, i didn't know that till after the whole process was over um it's a uh, so i you know because i knew mike and uh he uh like I said, he was a strong defender of liberty. So, yeah, and um, and some competition in the electoral process. We've had, lip, I mean, Republicans and Democrats for such a long time, over a hundred years, and in ninety nine point nine percent of all office, local, federal, state, etc., is Republicans and Democrats. And this society says so much about how important competition is. I mean, if you survey, you know what parties are in Congress right now and have been for a long time and what percentage of people call themselves independents or third party candidates. Uh, there doesn't seem to be the representation. Something is not making it through the bottleneck. Right. Um, now you're talking about surveying and lands. I would like to see a lot more land open up for people homesteading and, and maybe, you know, uh, so people can get some more land and, you know, live on it responsibly and, and things like that. And property rights. What about the uh, war on drugs if people can do whatever they want to their own body? Now, I, I'm not promoting drug use or anything like that, but uh, people do have a right to succeed or fail based on their own merits. And, and there are people suffering great consequences while there's people who are committing rape and murder that get out a lot sooner uh, from prison than people that might just use marijuana or cannabis or whatever you want to call it. What do you think the state of the war on drugs is? How can we reduce drug use without locking people up, Rick? Do you have a stance on that? Well, you know, of course we do. You know, that ingest into our own bodies, you know, we normally gravitate to the cannabis. But what about the raw milk? You know, they're arresting people for, for selling raw milk. If I want to ingest raw milk, it's, you know, or farm fresh eggs, you know, that's how, how mm -hmm. bad it's gotten. Um, 
when you look back at the at the history when the you know in the 30s when the when the states decided that they wanted to ban um alcohol you know, they didn't say hey DEA form another bureaucracy within the executive branch in the justice department and we'll call it the DEA or the Bureau of Alcohol and Firearms they amended the constitution because they said federal government we don't have that authority the states got to give it to us and it's the same thing and the same process with any any category or you know any any drug that's listed as a narcotic on their list that they've banned marijuana included they if they want to ban the feds when i say they if they want to ban marijuana then they go through the constitutional process to do it but they've usurped the powers from the states and because they've thrown all this money they all these strings attached through either the road funds or you know tax money through the schools that they're afraid to even um, even you know mention the word so um you know my my feelings on the war on drugs and we we look at the look at the uh, um, the prison systems and how overcrowded they are since 1972 just do that comparison when you know when the war on drugs started uh, started going full full steam ahead and uh, that incarceration rate hasn't stopped the uh, you know the the inflow in fact we just had up in great falls that night that i had the debate they arrested uh, a young man and a young girl underage for stabbing a girl in a marijuana sale that gone mad this is insanity this is crazy that we're resorting to this kind of uh of violence against each other, of not having any, you know, this is what the two party system has, has given us. It's given us us against them. You got it. I take it. And uh, that's, that's the, the shame and the sin of the whole thing is that um, we no longer respect each other. You know, your rights as a sovereign, my rights as a sovereign, and may the two not uh, conflict because I respect you and you respect me. And uh, you know, I made a special appeal to uh, to the Indian. Uh, we had we had, and this is probably the highlight of my whole trip up to Great Falls on Wednesday, is that there were five members from the Northern Cheyenne Reservation, uh, young too. They're probably in their mid twenties, and uh, they wanted their picture taken with me. I said, "You want your picture?" They said, "Yes." I said, "We came up here as Democrats, Juno supporters, and we're leaving Libertarians." He said, "Your speech gave me goosebumps." So, you know, we are reaching people. We are. And it's, uh, to me, you know, that gives me goosebumps just now, just what that young man told me. There are a lot of people out there uh, that feel just like that. And like you said at the very beginning of this uh, interview, that, um, you know, those percentages, they're real. We've got to find them and say, you know what, it's all right. You can do it. We can do it together. But me, we, from me to we to one, that's what we're going to go. We're going to go from me to we to one, and we're going to make it happen. Yeah, ride the wave. Ride the wave of public discontent. And the war on drugs isn't just a criminal issue. It also goes into, and just like any other issue, it goes into, you might think of the words um, revolving door, special interests. When you looked at Colorado and Washington and Oregon, the biggest groups that were against the referendums to decriminalize or, or legalize the cannabis plant, you know, were the pharmaceutical industries, were the um, alcohol companies. Uh, and so when you look at Washington and Congress and K Streets, I mean, you think about, you know, the terms revolving door, special interests, you know, heads of the FBI I mean, I'm not, not, not the FBI, the FDA yeah. are, are the same people that you, you know, there's just uh, these conflicts of interest. How would you approach that? You think there's uh, too much influence by corporations and our government? And, you know, some of these people who are running for Congress never had a real job in their life. Um, you know, you've been a surveyor, but some of these people just use it as a stepping stone. And so what do you say about that? Well, you know, I, I I'm not motivated by by blind ambition or personal um you know grand as much you know i i i'm answering a call of duty when mike uh, you know dropped the banner someone had to pick it up so i don't have that baggage behind me or you know supporting me on it um 
Yeah, this is this is crazy when these guys are spending three, four million dollars on a on a seat that um, is uh, is you know they're, they're bought and paid for, and uh, that corruption has uh, has permeated all of our. You can't turn on the TV without seeing it. I'm just, uh, I guess, you know, one little man and uh, me and my wife running the campaign, you know. And uh, my mom sent me 250 bucks. My dad wouldn't donate because he doesn't donate to, to political causes, so he wouldn't even support his own son. <laughs> but uh, that's uh, that's the attitude of today. And I was trying to remember some of the other questions you had in there because you put a couple in there. Could you go over it again for me, please? Sure, yeah, abs- good, absolutely. Good points. I wanted to make it. Yeah, there's – well, you know, you've had a real job as a surveyor. A lot of people seem to use running for one office to another as a stepping stone. You see this conflict of interest, like the head of the oh, FDA yeah. used to be the CEO yeah. of Monsanto. And, and so there's these um, – you know, the revolving door, and there's a lot of special yeah, interests. Yeah. And, you know, most congressional members spend about half their time raising funds instead of being with their constituents. And most of them right. have never had a real job. Yeah. You know, it's like the Treasury Department to Wall Street, you know, to the right to the New York yeah, the Fed, you know, I, yeah, that revolving door that's that's killed us. And um, yeah, I've had a real job and uh, you know, I'm partners with my son. And so I, I still got clients that I have to uh, I have to take their problems and and, and deal with them. You know, that uh, that will that we were working on 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 Friday, I had to write the you know shared well agreement for the and the legal descriptions for so we could insert them in the will. You know, this gal's 75 years old. So I, I still have real people, real problems, and real things that I have to be involved in, and I have to get personally involved in it. You know, because their their desires have to become mine, and I have to do what's right and best for them. So when when I come into you know like Denise Juno, she said, I want to be the first lesbian woman the first indian woman the first the first the, you know she she's got blind ambition and she has um you know put the aid of montana at least the public uh, schools in jeopardy because of it when she took office in 2008 montana was ranked 24th in the state uh as far as a national ranking is concerned now we're 42nd you know under her watch and all she can say is, well, we're, our, our tobacco use is down and our um, graduation rate is up. Well, what about your scholastic achievement? You know, we've forgotten what the school was supposed to do. and what, That's what blind ambition does. And uh, it's, you know, not only is it appalling, but look at the damage to that generation that, uh, that we won't be able to repair. We won't be able to repair it there. <laughs> They're lost. Yeah, so it sounds like her accomplishment was getting elected, and, and that's what she sees as the accomplishment exactly. in itself. And now, what you've been, um, you know, in the free markets. Do you think, would, if you were casting a vote for someone, do you think someone who actually has been in the free market would be better to understand the, the needs and the burdens of a small or mid sized business? What do you say about the environment? of small and mid-sized business. After all, I think the economy is probably the overarching issue over anything. You know, people want less crime. You want a better economy. If you want people to have better welfare, you know, you're going to need a better economy. What do you say about the state of small and mid-sized businesses? Is there anything we can do to help small and mid-sized businesses? And, and also, um, I'm going to ask a follow-up question on that about what do you think okay. about the trade deals like the TPP, oh, NAFTA, geez. et cetera. Don't get me started. Yeah, yeah um, you know, I had uh, I had 18 employees uh, in 2007 in both the surveying and construction uh, businesses that I had, and uh, by 2011 I was down to one. Um, what had happened in Montana as a as a surveyor? they had heaped on regulations to where it was you know, economically um, not feasible to uh, to develop any land. For instance, I had one project where I created 64 lots uh, that was, I, I just retraced them. They were created in auction in 1947. I retraced that for 148 bucks a lot. Uh, and by 
2007, they had changed the regulations so much. There's 64 different laws, rules, and regulations just so you can flush a toilet in Montana. 64 of them. We've gone from wow. $146 a lot to over $8,000 a lot just to get to preliminary plant. We haven't even put in the infrastructure or anything yet. So we've gone from 146 bucks a, a lot to create it to over forty forty five thousand dollars now kids can't afford that you know a guy coming up you know they don't have that opportunity it's just a travesty and most of my clients were mom and pops you know this is our our home and we want to give this piece to our kid and i said well crap you know here it's going to be twelve thousand dollars to do it and they go what and i said here here's what i'm going to have to do and just that overreaching regulation now let's get onto the TPP and the. Um, I wear a buckskin vest uh, to the um, to the debate. Well, it's an elk skin, and I wear it because I can't get a suit of clothes made in Montana. They're all made in China. This is the only thing I can get made in Montana because of what they've done with the uh, with the with the small um, tailor shops. I mean, I used to go to a a, a boot maker there in Kalispell. And I had my boots made because I got a weird foot from a from an injury, and um, he's out of business. He's gone because you know paying three hundred bucks for a pair of custom made boots, well we're getting them in from China, cheap leather for you know fifty four dollars a pair. Tell me about the devastation, you know, and it's it's sickening. And I try it every step. If I see you know something that's made locally, because I make my money locally, I buy it. This is uh, this is crazy what these guys have sold out. And in my debate on Wednesday, I said all the TPP was is people come to the table uh, so they don't get screwed, but they're screwing everybody else. And uh, that's you know the guy holding the end. Um, you know they're they're pegging the Chinese yuan below value, so they're flooding their markets with that, with the you know the same thing they did to the Japanese when I was a kid. Peg the yuan or the, the the yen low, and they flood it, flood the market. Well, they did the same thing with Canadian lumber in the 80s. So we're the ones that get screwed. We used to have 37 mills from Eureka, Montana, right on the North Canadian border, down to Darby, which is getting close to the Idaho line. Now we have two, two, two mills. It's devastating what they've done. Yeah, it's hard to compete against you know, slave wages and, and also in the same way, it's, you know, it could be somewhat hard to compete against these Republicans and Democrats who, you know, have control of the system and uh, pull the levers and have the presidential commission on debates, et cetera. So, you know, they kind of in the same boat there. Um, so actually, as far as regulations go with small businesses, I think that's uh, a huge issue. Like Bill Clinton said, it's the economy, yeah you know, stupid. And so stupid. that, yes, exactly. And um, now uh, what about the second amendment? Where's your stance on people's right to defend themselves? How do, how do you see, what's your approach with that? Well, I'm a very, very strong. That's one of the reasons that I, when I was asked to, to come in because both of our, these candidates are weak. None of them support the castle doctrine. Um, you know, if I'm out and about, I got, I, I pulled out my concealed carry permit and I challenge each of those guys to produce theirs. And I said, if that isn't good enough for you, you don't really need this, but here's the constitution. You ought to check the second amendment. Um, I'm a very, very strong supporter of it, that, um, what they have done, uh, to disarm and to, you know, emasculate the citizens, uh, through their, you know, Blasio in New York, all the way down to uh, to uh, Vera Katz in Portland. Look at what they've done to uh, to take that away. I, mean, I carry two weapons everywhere I go. <laughs> I won't be into this place. I went into the school, so I, it's a gun-free zone. But I carry two weapons with me everywhere I go. So if um, you care about the Second and, Amendment and the right to protect yourself, you're definitely in the candidates. And to to, to select here, and uh, okay, so I know that. EPA has overstretched in a lot of different ways, and it's probably a bloated system. But do you think it should be eliminated, or do you think the government has some role to protect the environment? The EPA is an unconstitutional uh, intrusion 
into here here's what they did done in montana we have an epa superfund site uh you know 18 miles from my house and it was a tie plant they used to make railroad ties there and um well we got two of them they used to make railroad ties and what did they do they came in and and uh fenced the place off studied it for 10 years brought in some dirt filled it in and made a community park out of it so so here they got this super fun supposedly super fun site with all this creosote and uh and and uh carcinogenics in the soil and they uh they make a park out of it these guys are are uh, an invasion into um and, and i'll throw fema in there too i get a lot of work because of what fema has done you know we got richard nixon to thank a republican to thank for both of those organizations i get a lot of work out of out of it um and to me, it's absolutely sickening when um, they get uh, go to get a loan for a house, and they say, "Well, you know, the floodplain's right here," and so I got They got to I got to charge them twelve hundred and fifty bucks to go and do a, a a loma, and then two years later, they after they get a big disaster, they raise the flood elevation by two feet, so now they're back in it again. And if Matthew would have hit, that's what happened after Katrina. If Matthew would have been a dead on one, we would have saw it again. These guys are out of control, and uh, EPA. I'll put in there the the BIA, the BIE, and the uh, Department of Education. So they're all unconstitutional in the way. Speaking about the 64 regulations, just to flush the toilet, it'd be nice to flush some of these regulations down the toilet. <laughs> yeah. you know? And hopefully, I can have my <laughs> name on it. Say the Breckenridge Bill to do it. Now, what about eminent domain? Um, how strict do you think pup people's um, rights should be on that? Do you think there's any exceptions? Do you think there should be some more safeguards? I mean, sometimes people might have bought some property on the upswing, and now they're being offered what's quote-unquote a fair price for their land, which might be 10 times less than what they originally bought it for since we're kind of in a downswing. What, what do you say about that, I mean, to people in some situations like that? Is it absolute? Well, Are there I'm, exceptions? Yeah, I'm, I'm a I'm a victim of that eminent domain. I had an office space, and they wanted to bring in the the highway system and and clear and clean me out. And um, you know they came in and lowballed me, and I held my ground for a couple of years, and then um, I actually got an appraisal, and we started from there. And this this is my advice to to um, to people who have who are you know, being being um, propositioned through the eminent domain, you know, with the hammer of eminent domain. Um, first thing that you do is when they come with their offer, uh, put it aside, accept it, put it aside, say, I'm going to think about it. Then go to your bank and get an appraisal, you know, because you got an arm's reach transaction. This is what I did. I'm a surveyor, so I kind of work with this stuff. I got an arm's reach transaction. Because I want, I said I'm going to refinance my my office, and so I got an arms reach transaction, and that appraisal was three times higher than what the appraisal for the highway department had given. And so we held on it. I said, I know you you got the power because you're the state, but here here's the appraisal. You're going to meet this, or we're going to court. We're going to draw the thing out. And and I twisted their arm, and they said, Uncle. Now, when they have like the New Haven case where they come in and, and condemn private property, you know, for private corporation, that is not only bovine scatology, that is theft and it's using, that's fascism. Yeah. Um, so I'll tell you, there's a time and a place uh, for it. Um, and when it happens, it's going to come, but there's things that you can do to protect yourself. So, um, you know, Montana has a constitutional eminent domain clause. And um, so I, I work within it. It's going to happen. I'm, I'm not an advocate for it. You know, you're not going to do it. But um, if you're going to fight the battle, make sure you get professional help and uh, make it uh, make it, you know, understand the process and you'll be all right. Yeah. And it's one thing if it's going to be used for public use and and like you said that you should at least get you know i think i think personally you should get more than a fair market value but if it's going to be used for like corporate casinos or or you know oh, some kind of new you know that's like you said is fascism where corporations and the public sector combine like that then yeah i, I think that's 
definitely not constitutional in a sense. Um, now, uh, let's see here. What, what do you think? Because you're running as a libertarian, and, and I don't think, you know, as far as the national level, people haven't really voted for a third party since the Republican Party themselves, really. I mean, I, I know there's been one or two. 1860. Independents. <laughs> 1860. So how are you going to convince the people? I mean, really, I, I hear I can understand some hesitation, like I don't want my vote to be wasted. If I vote for you, then it's a, more of a chance that the lesser person that I want is going to be elected. But mm-hmm. there's a lot less of a risk if and I can understand that at the presidential level, but we're talking about the congressional level where there's a buffer of 435 people. So it's not as much of a risk. You're really spreading out your risk between 435 people. And so if there's any place to take that risk, I would say it would be in the U S house of representatives. And another buffer that the founders put into place is that it's only for two years. So how do you convince people to make certain that, you know, you're the best choice it's for for two years and and to give you a two year chance. Well, here, here's what I what I did in the debate. I, I, I made an appeal. I said I'm making an appeal to you voters across the Indian country. I want you to know that it, a libertarian has never done you any harm, has never raised a hand in anger or cheated you or lied to you. Okay, and so you want to look at who's responsible for the trail of tears. It was a Democrat, Andrew Jackson, who was responsible for wounded me. It was uh, Benjamin Harrison. All right, from the big hole to the big horn, that was Republican policies. And so I made a special appeal to them, and it resonated. Really, it did. We're not going to do you any harm. We want what's best for you. You're, you're, you know, you're brothers just like we are. And uh, then to the to the Bernie Sanders supporters, I said, you know, you felt the burn. Uh, when you when you heard his message, and then you felt the burn when you found out that the gig was rigged on the inside, and I'm gonna ask you to feel, make them feel the burn this time. All right, you guys aren't a bunch of basement dwellers like Hillary Clinton says you are. I want you to. Th- we had 151,000 of those people vote in the primary in Montana, and so I made a special appeal of unity across, reach across, or we have things in common that we can work on together. And then, you know, the, the Ron Paul supporters in Montana, 28% of them voted for Ron Paul. That's enough. We get, you know, the 60% uh, Bernie Sanders, the Indian vote, to, at least to think about it. And then, hey, we got it. We got a great coalition, a great coalition of ideas that uh, are going to um, to help change the direction. And I think if we can, you know, get that message out. Now, I'll be in that debate forum tonight, and I'm going to make the same appeal. And right. so uh, we two, do. Two more. Uh, yeah. Just uh-huh. two more no, questions uh, here. So I know your debate's okay. coming up here. Um, so you might not get past every single thing that you want to get past, but you are definitely going to be able to make a difference. I mean, after all, there's 435 oh, yeah. members. What kind of message? Mm-hmm. What, what just? How would it change the paradigm having? just even one libertarian elected to the U S house of representatives, even if you weren't able to pass everything that you're proposing here. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, I'd start by saying, um, you know, let's look at the failure of the, of the Bureau of Indian affairs. And instead of, you know, keep throwing money at this thing, like uh, Schoolcraft said in 1828, let's do block grants and let's get, Indian health services, get rid of the socialized medicine there. We'll use those block grants to, um, to, we still, we're not going to get these people off the morphine all at once, bam. But at least let's bring that discussion into the, uh, into the debate on the, on the floor of the house. when we're talking about those funding that, that we can do uh, some, some small changes that will have a very, very great impact. Um, you know, I know that as soon as I put a bill in there to abolish the EPA, I'm going to get blown out of the out of the um, you know subcommittee on the environment. Um, people aren't really uh, ready to uh, accept that they're the cause of the problem. I mean, we got 435 members in that in that body, and they all think there's solution. Every one of them, every one of them thinks that their ideas is going to be the save all and the end all. And uh, we got to work quietly, and we got to, you know, work on coalition. And I can do that with the Indian vote. I can do that with the Bernie Sanders. Those guys are hardcore. 
No, they'll be on the horn and and uh, moving and shaking. I don't know. Absolutely. That's, uh, that's I think you hit the nail uh, on the head as far as changing the debate. That's what you're going to do is, um, yeah, you know, that's, expand that's all the I can debate. Do. Yep. Now, one last question, Rick. I'm sorry to interrupt here. Okay. Uh, who, who's some of your favorite people, past or present? Some of my favorite people. Wow. Um, I got a you know, I, 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 cause I, I don't really, uh, let's, let me go this way. Um, I have relatives in, in, in politics that, uh, you know, John Cabell Breckenridge is a distant relative of mine. And, um, I, I think that I owe a little bit of an apology because, uh, you know, Ned Lamont is my cousin and his great grandfather and my great grandmother were, were first, uh, first cousins. And he's the one that's responsible for the whole mess and the paradigm that we have here uh, with uh, J.P. Morgan on the right and him on the left. You know, if you read Carol Quigley's A, a Brief History of Time, I was amazed at you, you, how much you find Thomas Lamont in there. And he um, – so I owe an apology to the country, I think, to helpfully correct that. Not saying that he's one of my favorite people, but he's one of the um, – one of the um, – people that we got to rectify the the wrong that has happened probably my my favorite historical um um you know person in recent time has got to be you know ron paul he just lit a fire in me and and i got hold of the vision and i i can understand and relate to you know bernie sanders people well when i got to meet ron paul just a quiet little diminutive man and but he's you know he. He said some straight things, at least to me, at that place at that time, and got me activated, even though I got in the Republican Party and realized that they lost their soul, and uh, they didn't want it back. And so um, he would have to be one of them. Of course, this country was run by surveyors, uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Abraham Lincoln, we call Mount Rushmore, three surveyors. Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark, yeah, both captains in the Army, and I was a captain in the Army. And, um, you know, what I did with Ge- Geographic Information System was prove that what Thomas Jefferson's vision for the country with a public land survey system, that I could take it into the 21st century. And uh, that, uh, that to me, is a notable um, um, historical feat that we have a man who, you know, so we got to get this thing surveyed on the ground and the uh, Land Ordinance Act of 1785 was uh, computerized in 2000 when uh, they adopted uh, the, the process I developed in Flathead County for all states west of the Mississippi. So I'd have to go with, you know, military man would be um, would be uh, probably uh, Lewis and just what he did. And uh, my uh, surveyor uh, protege would be my grandfather and uh, Thomas Jefferson. Because they were both uh, brilliant men and uh, fired me. That sounds great, Rick. And since you brought it up, I've never shared with anyone. I'm an independent. And actually, uh, when Ron Paul first ran in 2008, I changed my party affiliation to Republican so I could vote for him in the primaries. Huh? And then actually, that, this last year, I had changed it to Democrat so I could vote for Bernie Sanders in the primaries. Huh? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch so I, back to uh, Hopefully, I hit something so, with you. Yeah, you did. You did. You did. So we're not endorsing anyone, resonated, but we are endorsing a fair system. Yeah. yeah no. Rick, uh, great to we talk are. with you. We appreciate your you uh, time here. Yeah, Any final you, no. words yeah. of wisdom, sir? Um, you know, this, uh, this, this process uh, takes uh, an extraordinary amount of, of effort, and, um, and the odds are stacked against us. But, uh, you know, one man – that will stand up or one woman that will stand up is one man of courage. And you know what? Don't, uh, don't be intimidated by the, by the system. These guys will run over the top of you as, as sure as they will any timid man. But if you stand up to them, um, they, they will respect it. They'll back off. You know, I, I had to do that with, um, with the, with the party here in, in uh, Montana. And I told them, you know what, you guys are going to have hell to pay. And tonight, you know, hell is riding in, and they're gonna they're gonna have to. So um, don't give up, you guys. Don't ever 
ever give up on this thing, okay? Because uh, your your voice does matter, and your um, your participation proves it. So thank you, and thank you, Thomas, for this opportunity. I've, uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, we we very much appreciate it, everyone. Um, Rick Breckenridge. Uh, it's, again, you can visit facebook.com forward slash Breckenridge dot Congress.